Molly was dead to begin with. There was no doubt about it. The register of his burial was signed by many people, including the clerk, the undertaker, and Scrooge himself. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. I don't mean to say that I know, of my own knowledge, what there is particularly dead about a doornail. It was just the best metaphor I could come up with for it. Scrooge knew that he was dead, and they were partners for many years. My name is Charles Dickens. And I think it is time to introduce Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, here we go. Oh, look, here comes Scrooge now. Scrooge was hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained, and as solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, had thin lips blew, and spoke out shrewdly in his grating voice. Oh, that was a lot. What I'm trying to highlight here is Scrooge is, was not a nice man. External heat and cold had little influence on Scrooge. No warmth could warm him, no wintry weather chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow was more intent upon its purpose, no pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. Tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, with handsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once... Wait. Oh, dear. I've lost my script again. Ah, yes. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired away to such and such a place as Scrooge. Even the blind man's dogs appeared to know him. And when they, when they saw him coming would tug their owners into doorways and up courts. Then they would wag their tails as though they said no eye is better than at all than no eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. He was an outsider. Isolated. And didn't care about what society thought of him. Once upon a time... Of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold weather, foggy, and he could hear the people outside, wheezing up and down, beating their hands upon their breasts and stamping their feet upon the pavement stones to warm them. Bah! Humbug. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that. 
I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right of you to be merry? You're poor enough. What right of you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Bah! Humbug! Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in a world of such a lot of fools? Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older but not a penny richer? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips will be burned through his own pudding and buried with a stick of holly through his heart. Uncle, nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and I'll keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Then leave me alone, then. But, Uncle. Good afternoon. Uncle. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry for bothering you. But... Can we please be friends? Good afternoon. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word. Notwithstanding, he stopped at the outer door to bestow his greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge, for he returned them cordially. There's another fellow, my clerk, with fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a merry flipping Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. Just as Scrooge was starting to get back to his counting work, two portly gentlemen came in. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Mr. Marley. Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago, on this very night. We have no doubt his liberty, his liberality, is well represented by his surviving partner. Humbug. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at this present time. Many, many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Oh, oh. Plenty of prisons, sir. And the Union workhouses, are they still in operation? They are still, unfortunately, sir. Wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and poor law are in full vigour then. Both very busy, sir. Oh, I was afraid, from what you said at first, that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm very glad to hear it. Um, so what should I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, sir. Many would rather die. If they better, if they want to die, then they better do it. 
decrease the surplus population. But you might know it. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Good afternoon, gentlemen. The gentleman left his counting house. And Scrooge was left alone with his clerk, Bob Cratchit. You'll want all day off tomorrow, I suppose. It would, it would be quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk po promised that he would, and left. Scrooge went home. Scrooge arrived back home, enjoyed his dinner, and sat on his chair by the fire. But soon after, he heard a noise. He checked around. Ah, it's humbug. Humbug! He heard bells ringing. It grew louder. And more violent. Ah. Until... A white being appeared in front of him. Who are you? What are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marth. Can you sit, sit down? Sit down? Yes, I can. Do, do it then. Scrooge asked the question, but he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair. You don't believe in me? I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. It's humbug. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigestive piece of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than of grave about you. More gravy than of grave? What? It's humbug. Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I, I do, I do, okay. Okay, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? 
It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. These chains are the chains I forged in life. I made them link, link by link and yard by yard using my own sins. The weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself is almost ten times as long and heavy as mine. But, but where have you been? Travelling? Seven years dead and travelling all the time. The whole time. You travel fast? On the wings of the wind. You were always a man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. I suffer most. But hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will, I will. But don't be hard upon me. Please, Jacob. We were friends in life. How is it our time appear before you in a shape that you can see? You will be haunted by three spirits. I'd, I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first ghost tomorrow, when the bell tolls one, the second ghost when the bell tolls three, and the last when the bell tolls five. C could I take them all at once and have it over, please, Jacob? Expect the first ghost when the bell tolls one. And with that, Marley left leaving Scrooge alone and dark. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. The clock beat twelve. And then later... It beat one. A heart, a deep, dull, hollow, cold one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside. I tell you by a hand, not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back but those to which his face was addressed. It was a strange figure. Scrooge didn't know what it was. It's all humbug. I won't believe it. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me. I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. What would you soon put out? Worldly hands, the light I give. Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap 
and force me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my breast. What have you come for? Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. Ah. Come to the window. But I, I am immortal and liable to fall. Bear not a touch of my wing here, and you shall fly. Good heavens, what is all this? Am I dreaming this? I will take you to a place long begun, long in the past. Scrooge, I don't know where Scrooge was taken, but he sure didn't like it. What, what are we doing here, spirit? Your lip is trembling. You recollect the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfolded. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognising every gate and post and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church, marking town, and winding river. A school appeared, and one child, solitary, neglected by his friends, lay there. Scrooge said he knew it, and then he sobbed. Oh, oh, poor, poor boy. Poor boy. That is you, Scrooge. That is you. Yes, I know. But it's too late now. What's the matter? I cannot be redeemed. It's too late now. The desk suddenly disappeared. And there was a knock at the door. The door opened. And a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in. Putting her arms around his neck, hugging and kissing him. And calling him, Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. 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 Home, little fan? Home? Yes, home, for good and all. Home, forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. That home is like heaven. You are quite a woman, little fan. Great speaker as well. Let's see... Another Christmas. <sighs> Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city. Um, shadowy passengers passed and repassed where shadowy carts and coaches battled for their way and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. I know it. I was an, I, I, I was an apprentice here. Oh, oh look, it's, it's Fezziwig. Old Fezziwig. Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig 
lay down his pen, looked at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, and his shoes of, to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo, Ebenezer! Yo-ho, my boy! No more work tonight! Christmas Eve, Ebenezer! Christmas Eve! Let's have the shutters up! Before a man can say, Jack Robinson. Young Ebenezer and Fezziwig cleared everything away. There was nothing that couldn't be cleared away. Neat and tidy. In came Mrs. Fezziwig. In came lots of others. Joining the party. Now, do you now see the importance of family and having a big heart? No. Family is a waste of time. Please, no more spirit. Please let me go. One more. No. Oh. No, spirit. I am not sitting through this anymore. You will. You will sit through this. No. Leave me. Leave me now. I've noticed for the past couple of minutes that your light has been extinguished. No. 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 He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further of being in his own bedroom, he gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and he sank into a heavy sleep. Awaking in the middle of a tough snore, and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of three. He felt that he was stored to consciousness in the right nick of time. And then he saw a light in the other room and went to investigate. Trembling, Scrooge went and saw a large figure in the room. Oh, ho, ho, ho. come in! And know oh, me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Scrooge was resentful, but did it anyway. You have never seen anyone quite like me before, have you? Have you? Never. Have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, m meaning my elder brothers born these later years. 
I don't think I have. You, you, you have many brothers? More than 1,800. A, a tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my foot. Touch it. Scrooge went ahead and touched the, the spirit's foot. and was took into an array of images of Christmas foot. Do you recognize that house over there? Yeah, yes. It's Bob Cratchit, my clerk. Yes. There are some on this earth of yours who lay claim to know us and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry and selfishness in our name, who are estranged to us and all our kith and kin, as if they had never lived. Remember that and change their doings on themselves. Not us. Scrooge promised that he would. And they went on, invisible, as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. And finally reached the house of Robert Cratchit. Inside housed Mrs. Cratchit. With her son, Peter and her daughter, Belinda. She was dressed out in a nice gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and make a goodly show for sixpence. She laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda, second of her daughters, and brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen and the fashionable parks. They were preparing to cook a goose when Mr. Cratchit, Bob, came in with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. No. What's the tea? Goose. The goose. The, the goose. Oh, no. Well, calm down, son. It's very difficult for you. And, and how did little Tim behave? Oh, as good as gold. And better. Somehow, he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hopes that people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant for them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremendous, tremulous when he told them this, 
and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. It was indeed a goose. God bless us, everyone. No, 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 no. Spirit, kind spirit, say Tiny Tim will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none of the of my race return return the ghost. We'll find him here. What then? If he'd be like to die, he had better do it. And de and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit, and was overcome with penitence and grief. I give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. And I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, Christmas Day. I know it's I know it's Christmas Day, but but an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I suppose we should drink his health for your sake and the days. Not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy. I have no doubt. The children drank their toast. The Cratchits were left. And Scrooge was taken to his nephew's house. To Fred's house. What? Where are we going, spirit? Your nephew. He's having a dinner tonight, isn't he? Yes. He asked you to kill him, but you decided against it. Yes, of course. Humbug. Let's go visit them now, shall we? Okay, okay, let's play a game. The game is called Yes and No. Yes and No was a game where Scrooge, his nephew, thought of something and the rest must find out what. He can only answer their questions with yes or no. The brisk fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, didn't live in a menagerie, was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, an ass, a cow, a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get up off the sofa and stamp. At last, someone cried out, I found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. 
It's your Uncle Scrooge. Which it certainly was. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure. And it will be ungrateful not to drink his health. Here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment. And I say, Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy Old Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge. Fred and his party members disappeared. And Scrooge was left alone with the spirit. No, no, he can't leave. My time grows short. But, but, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? I'm, so, I'm sorry for things I did. You will meet the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And I shall leave you. Go. Go forth. And know him better, man. Scrooge, look around him for the ghost. And saw it not. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down, for in the very air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach the figure from the night, and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. It had a similar image to the Grim Reaper. The spirit neither spoke nor moved. And that its mysterious presence filled Scrooge with a solemn dread. A am I am I in the presence of the ghost of C Christmas yet to come? The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You, you, are, you are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the future before us. Is that so, spirit? He receives no answer. Ghost of the future. I, I, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. Lead on, lead on. The night is one waning fast. And it's precious time to me, spirit. Please lead on. The spirit moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress 
which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They seemed to enter a dark and gloomy city. Oh, well, what's going on here? Oh, when did he die? Last, last night, I believe. Oh, sometime Christmas Day. What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. What has he done with his money? Well, he hasn't left it to me, that's for sure. It's likely to be a cheap funeral. For the life of me, I can't think of anybody who want to go to it. I don't mind going. If lunch is provided. <laughs> Funny. Spirit. Spirit. Who is this unhappy man? The, it, the case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life turns that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? The room was very dark. Too dark. A cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death set up fine altar here. It casts such terrors as thou hast to thy command. For this thy dominion. Suddenly, it slightly brightened a bit. And Scrooge was greeted with a familiar sight. It was the house of Bob Cratchit. The ghost of Christmas yet to come stood at the back of the room just in case Scrooge made any sudden moves. The, the, the colour! The colour hurts my eyes. Oh, oh, they're better now. It makes them weak by candlelight. And I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. He has been walking slowly these past couple of days. But... We knew he wouldn't survive. Just at that moment, Bob Cratchit came through the door. Ooh. Robert. Yes, my dear. I wish you would have gone. It would have you it would have done you good to see how green a place I did that is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. I promised him. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. Little, little child. He was a good soul. You would be sure of it, my dear. If you saw and spoke to him, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. The Cratchits all kissed each other. Shook hands. The spirit of Tiny Tim, thy childish essence, was from God. Spectre. 
Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what, what that man who was flying on the bed is. Tell me, the ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him. As before, though at a different time, he thought. Instead, there seems no order in these latter visions, save though in the future. Into the resort of business, businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the ends just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. Th this, this court, through which we hurry now, is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Why do you point close? Why do you point away? Wait, the churchyard. Why are we? Why are you taking me here? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, to which, if pers persevered. They must lead, but if the course is to be departed from, the ends will change. Please, are these the shadows of things that will be, or the shadows of things that may be only? Please answer me, spirit. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards the grave. Whose name is on the stone? No. This can't be. No, no, spirit. Spirit, no, no, no. Good spirit. I will promise, I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons of all three ghosts. That they, that, wait, what? That, that, that they teach. That, that. Oh, tell me, I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Where are you, spirit? Where are you? Scrooge! Scrooge! Awoke! Yes, the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiest of all. The time before him was his own to make amends. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. O oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time me praise for this. I say it on my knees. O oh, Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel, as merry as a schoolboy, and as giddy as a drunken man. Whoa, whoa. Yes.
the bells. Glorious, glorious bells. Scrooge looked at the window. What's today, my friend? What? What? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Well, it is Christmas Day. Why Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. Of course they can. Of course they can. They can do anything they like. Hello, my fine fellow. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one? At the corner. I should hope I did. An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little one, the big one. Is the one as big as me? Yeah, it's still there. Oh, it is. Go buy it. Walker. No, no. I am being serious. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here. I'll give the that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man, and I'll give you a shilling. Come back in with him in less than five minutes, and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have, he must have got a steady hand as a trigger who could have shot off half a so fast. Uh, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. Scrooge went. Scrooge went through the streets. Being merry. When he came across one of the portly gentlemen who had come into his counting house the day before and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. My, my dear sir, Mr. Scrooge. Yes, that is my name. And I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon. And will you have my goodness? Lord bless me. Are you serious? If you please, not a farthing less than what I promise you. A great many back payments are included in it. I assure you. Will you do me that favour? My dear sir, I don't know what to say to such magnificent... Don't say anything, please. Don't. Come and see me. Will you come and see me, please? Yes, Mr. Scrooge, I will. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. The portly gentleman went off, and Scrooge knocked on the door of Fred, his nephew's house. Fred? Mr. Scrooge? Why, bless my soul. It is I. I have come to dinner. Will you please let me in? Oh, of course. Of course, definitely. Welcome home, Uncle. Welcome. 
wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. <laughs> oh, oh, he was early there. If it, if he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he had set his heart upon. The clock struck nine. No, Bob. A quarter past. No, Bob. He was a full 18 minutes behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. Mr. Bob Cratchit came through the door. So, sorry, sorry I'm late, sir. So, sorry, sorry I'm late. Sorry I'm late. I'm very sorry, I am behind my time. You are. Step this way. It's only once a year, sir. It's only once a year. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A Merry Christmas, Bob. It could not be mistaken. Scrooge had definitely changed. Now, you go have yourself some fun. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Oh, thank you. He went outside. And strolled through the streets. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all. And infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, Scrooge is like a second father. He became as good a friend, as good as master, as good as man. As good as, as the good old city knew, or any good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed. Some people took it. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. Scrooge was a miserly old man. Scrooge was nasty. Present. and future. Due to be released at midnight on Christmas Eve 2018. Scrooge was a miserly old man. Scrooge was 
nasty. One bug. Two. Present. And future. Due to be released at midnight on Christmas Eve 2018.